Well, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Dave Higgins. I'm one of the pastors here at Woodman, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here to this service and also maybe give you a couple of insights that might be of real value to you, something that might really help you. Now, if you're new, you're a guest today, or it's just, you know, I've been in your shoes. Uh, it hasn't been that long ago. You know, wondering, where do I park? Uh, what pew do I sit in? Uh, where is the worship center? You know, and then I got in and I'm trying to determine, well, what kind of ministries and what kind of things? Is this the right place for me? And so we did something that day that I think would be really helpful to you. And that is that uh, you would go to that uh, uh, Connect Central that's just around the corner here over to my left. And that's a great kind of a hospitality center there. And there you can find so many great answers you can share some of your story. There are people there that really are gracious people, and they just want to just help you and make you feel at home. And so you're going to be way ahead of the game if you just go and just kind of visit with those people after the service. It would be a great thing for you to do. Now, for the rest of us, something that we per, you know, really need to do, if you don't already, is to download the Woodman app. That would be something that would be a real great blessing to you. In fact, as I look at this, I realize, oh, there's all kinds of things. There's a, a Bible reading plan there. There's opportunities to share any prayer requests that you might have. Uh, you can find some fresh stories on just how God is working through the people of Woodman. Uh, a lot of information. And now, if you're not sure, well, how, how do I get that app? Well, you just go to the app store. But if you've never done that before, you're trying to figure it out, you can either go to those great people who are in our hospitality area, and they'll be happy to help you uh, get that. Or you could just go to a 14-year-old, and they'll get it down for you. So it would just be really great. And, uh, and, of course, if you already have the app, there's oh, so many good things, but you can find your sermon notes in there, the list of songs that we're going to be singing today, and, of course, a lot of the activities that would be really helpful for you to be a part of, like the Spring City Serve that's coming up. Uh, I mean, good things happen when God's people do things together. Amen? I mean, that's just really great. And if, to be able to bless our community is just a great thing, especially when you have other churches that are kind of joining in. And it's on that May 3rd and 4th. And that, those are the two days. There's all kinds of activities and things that you can be a part of. You know, there's some schools that need some TLC, all kinds of projects, something that you could be a part of. And again, you can look on the app. It'll give you all the information you need and also how to kind of sign up for that. We want to love well, don't we? That's a great way to do it. Well, hey, we've come to worship, haven't we? Let's stand. Let's sing. Our God is alive and working in our, high, in our lives. Amen? All right. Alive. 
are the same God You answered prayers back then And you will answer now You are the same God You are the same God You were providing then You are providing now You are the same God Stop working Even when I don't see it
Isn't that who he is? He's making a way. He's always working for us. Generation after generation, he's done that. Um, let me get, I lost my train of thought for a moment. Um, my name is Brent. If we haven't met, this is April. This is Johnny. And we are so thankful to be able to have this time with you to sing these songs, to celebrate who Jesus is and what he's doing. And the God that we serve is moving and working in our midst. Um, and the best place we can find that in is, is in his word. And sometimes I take that for granted, um, but it's always there for us. And it shows us the hope that we have and the strength that we have in him. So before we sing another song, we wanted to, sing, to, to read scripture over you to encourage you maybe to, for God to speak into parts of your story this week of things that you're walking through. But hear the word of the Lord and be encouraged. This is Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand, and the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life, and the Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. This is from Romans 8, starting in verse 37. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and he raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship. We were created in Christ for good works for which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And from Revelation 15, great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Amen. Let's continue to worship and sing out to that holy one.
justice and your mercy, revival in our city. We
may we, may we be reminded of your, your strength with us, your presence with us. Lord, make us more like Jesus. Lord, I pray that you bless this offering that we're about to take and bless this time that we can study your word. In your name we pray. my Lord and Savior. He was the Son of God. Love and, and hope. I've really started to see Jesus as my closest friend. Only human who ever lived a perfect life. Jesus is God, I think. Jesus was a man, from what I figured. I'm sure he was just, you know, good at what he did or something. A link between all religions. Likely he existed as a person. He was a dude. Pretty awesome. He had a beard. I just think he's a big man. I think he's more than whatever they ask. Like, you know, the fact that he was kind of a real guy. He's got Jesus is the light of the world. Well, hello, church. So good to see you all here, here at uh, Woodman Heights. It's great to be with you guys. And of course, I want to say hello to the rest of the Woodman family, those that are at Monument, Rock Ribbon, Southwest, of course, the fellas at Ark Valley. And I also want to recognize all those people that are watching online. Some of you are from right here in El Paso County. Others we know are watching across the United States and even many of you from around the world. So welcome. Well, my name is Kurt, one of the pastors here at Woodman, and today we are continuing our series called Jesus Is, where we're looking at the seven different times that Jesus made that statement about himself in the gospel according to John. Jesus said, I am, and then he made some really pretty bold claim about himself after that. Well, you know, centuries before Jesus even walked on the earth, I am developed some very special meaning. If we go all the way back to the time of Moses, Moses was this Jewish man who was raised in Egypt, and at the time, the Jews were enslaved in Egypt. And Moses is able to escape out of that, and then God calls him, and God tells Moses, I want you to go back into Egypt, and I want you to bring my people out of slavery. And so Moses has a question that he asks God. He says, well, God, who should I tell them is sending me? And it's at this moment that God gives his very holy and personal name to Moses. God says, I am that I am, tell them I am has sent you. These three little words, or two little, two little words, three little letters, I am, actually communicate a lot. God is saying, I am God. I am the only God. I am the creator, the author, the sustainer, the provider of everything. I am. And so it's this eternal sovereign name that God has given himself that was so revered that there were many Jewish people who would dare not even utter that name. In fact, when scribes would be writing down scripture, when they came to the name of God, rather than writing the letters of the name of God, they would put four dots to signify the four Hebrew letters that make up this holy name of God. It's this holy name of God that Jesus himself uses seven different times to talk about himself. And with each I am statement, Jesus is giving us a clearer and clearer picture of who he is and why he's come. These statements that he made oftentimes left his audience in, in, in need of pondering these profound statements that he made. And at the end of them, Jesus is really asking, who do you say that I am? And how those people answered that question would impact not only how they lived, but their entire eternities. And we have the same question in front of us today. Who do you say that Jesus is? Well, let me pray, and then we're gonna turn to the gospel according to John chapter eight. Father, we, we thank you, first of all, that you, the sovereign God of the universe, Father, you have chosen to reveal yourself through the pages of scripture. Father, we can learn about you, about your character. Father, we can be driven to your son. And, and so we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. Father, I pray today as, as we look at your word, Father, would you be at work in all of our hearts and minds and Father, would you make us keenly aware of those messages, those things that you might have just for each one of us. 
And Father, as always, I just pray that you would work through any bumbling or stumbling that I might have. And Father, that your message becomes clear despite the one who's giving it. Pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, again, we're gonna be in John chapter eight, starting with the 12th verse. And actually, I'm gonna read the entire text that we're looking at today, and then we'll jump back in and take a look at it in a little more detail. So this is, again, John chapter eight, beginning with verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. And so the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. And Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. But you do not know where I came from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about me, and my father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? And Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. I wanna provide a little context before we jump back into scripture. And again, Jesus is issuing one of these I am statements and it tells us that he is in the temple near the treasury. Now the, the temple was the pinnacle of worship for the Jews at that time. It was this large building in the middle of Jerusalem. You could see it from all over the city. And, and that was the place where the sovereign God of the universe would dwell among his people. It was the overlap between heaven and earth. And it tells us that he was near the treasury. There were different courtyards surrounding the temple. The most outer courtyard was the courtyard of the Gentiles and everyone was welcome there. And then the next courtyard was the courtyard of women. And it wasn't that just women could go there, but that was all the further they were allowed. And the treasury is in the courtyard of women. So Jesus is teaching largely to Jewish men and women in this courtyard. And it's just after the Jewish festival or the Feast of the Booths. Gotta be really careful to articulate that, booths, so I don't lisp too bad. But the Festival of the Booths was was this time when men who were around Jerusalem would create these tents, and they would live in these tents for seven days, and that was the Festival of Booths. And the reason they were doing this is because it was reminding them of that time when Moses led them out of captivity, led them out of slavery. They spent 40 years in the wilderness. And during that time, they were living in tents. And so this was a reminder of God's provision, God's rescue out of slavery, his provision in the wilderness, and the fact that he would lead them to the promised land. One of the things that they would celebrate during the Feast of the Booths was this big candelabra. And so there was a candle that was lit and would would be running for all seven days. And it signified the pillar of fire that led the Israelites through the wilderness during these 40 years. God himself led the Israelites by day as a cloud of smoke and at night as this column of fire. And so they would light this candle to remind themselves of God's presence leading them from slavery to the promised land. And then at the end of the seven weeks, this large candelabra would be blown out and the Feast of Booths was over. Now, scripture doesn't tell us what the conversations were like in the temple that day that Jesus was there, but I, I do wonder if maybe the people weren't longing for those days when God was right in front of them as a pillar of fire leading them through the night. And it's with that background, Jesus is in this temple just after the Feast of Booths that Jesus makes this bold claim in verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. In many ways, I think it's a pretty straightforward statement. And yet it is packed with allusions and references from across the pages of scripture. First of all, as we've already seen, even these small words, I am, are packed with meaning as it's the personal name that God has given himself. Jesus is saying, I am not just some prophet or a wise teacher. 
I have the power and authority of God. I am God in the flesh. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Light is a theme, again, we see throughout the pages of scripture. Psalm 119 says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. That same word that Jesus was the word incarnate. And then in Isaiah 9, looking forward to this coming Messiah, Isaiah says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. Isaiah continues in chapter 49. He says that the Messiah will be as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. And light is not just linked to this Messiah, but to God himself. In Psalm 27, it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And Lord, there's that personal name of God. John records 22 different times where he talks about Jesus being light in his gospel account. In fact, he starts it out in John 1, the fourth verse says, in him was life, speaking of Jesus, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Seven words, I am the light of the world. That communicates quite a bit. Like light, Jesus is the giver and sustainer of life. Like light, Jesus provides direction, hope, and purpose. Like light, Jesus proclaims truth and exposes falsehood and exposes humanity's wickedness. I think it's also interesting that Jesus doesn't say, I am a light. Jesus said, I am the light. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have eternal life. Again, it's a bit of speculation, but with the Feast of Booths, Fresh in everyone's memory, I wonder if they long for that pillar of fire, that light from God to guide them, to take them from slavery, oppression, darkness, and struggle, and lead them into the promised land. And here is Jesus, true God, true man, light of the world. He alone is the way out of darkness, providing the way to eternal life. You know, I don't know if you guys can relate to this, but back when my kids were younger, every now and then my wife would get this crazy idea that it would be a great idea to go camping. And usually it was like loading everything up after Friday and maybe I got off of work late and by the time we got everything loaded, got all the kids in the car, we're driving up and we get to the campground and man, it is pitch dark. And I don't know if you've ever tried to set up a campsite with small kids in the middle of the dark, but it is not easy. Right, you have no idea what the ground is like if you're even in the right spot. You could be setting your tent in the middle of the road. You're not sure, and I'm struggling with all the pipes and the poles and the stakes and getting this whole thing in, and, and I'm always kind of swinging my arms, just hoping I don't run into a tree and scratch up my face. But you know, a funny thing happens the longer you kind of struggle and are in the dark. All of a sudden, I started to make some things out. I could see the outline of trees, and so I knew to avoid those. And way off in the distance, I could see this jagged line, and so I figured there must be a mountain range back there. And the longer I was there, I started to feel a little bit more comfortable about being in the dark. And then the morning comes after you get a night's sleep, and and you unzip that zipper on your tent, and you come out, and the morning sun is there, and it's like you're in a whole different world, even though you're in the exact same place. And all of a sudden, I can see the rocks that I was tripping over the night before. And I can see the soft green moss that's growing on them. The trees are no longer some jagged outline, but I can actually see their branches and the bark and the birds in them. And and those mountains that I figured were off in the background are now this stunning snow-capped mountain range with a mountain lake at its base. I'm in the same place, but because of the light, I can see so much more. You know, I think there's a couple of different possibilities for those that are living in the darkness. To be honest, some of them start to get used to it. They're getting by. They're adjusting to the dark. They're starting to make out some small things. And I wonder if those people maybe can't even imagine that there's anything else out there that the light might shine on them. Some may even fear the light. They don't want that light to come because if that comes, it's gonna expose themselves and their actions and people are gonna know who they really are. So I wonder if there's some people who have gotten comfortable or wanna stay hidden in the dark. I think there's also a whole another group 
those that know they're in the darkness. They feel the pain and the anguish every day and they long for the light to come. And maybe that's you, feeling trapped, stumbling alone in the dark. Perhaps you realize you spent way too much of your life pursuing the wrong things, achievements that you thought would bring meaning to your life and then once you got them, they too were meaningless. Perhaps you feel like you're lacking motivation, purpose, feeling stuck. You believe there's got to be more to life than video games and binge watching TV or scrolling endlessly through social media posts. In fact, a recent study from Harvard found that 50% of young Americans, those in their late teens to their late 20s, 50% of Americans say they feel down, depressed, and hopeless. I wonder, might you be a prisoner of the dark, unaware that there's something better out there? Or are you one of those that if you're honest, you like the anonymity of the dark? Kind of find yourself hiding there, hiding yourself and hiding your actions. Or perhaps you're one of those that you despise the dark and you are desperate for the light, but you don't know how to get there. This is the question that Jesus puts before all of us. What is stopping you from following him, following the light of the world, because he alone can lead to eternal life? Jesus has just made this bold claim that he is the light of the world, and now he will face a baseless challenge. Look at verse 13. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing testimony about yourself. Your testimony is not true. To me, it's just fascinating that Jesus makes this bold claim, right? I am the light of the world. Salvation comes through him. And here's the Pharisees. These were the Jewish religious leaders of the day. These were the men who knew God's word, knew his law inside and out. And so they take claim, or they take issue, excuse me, with the claim of Jesus. Because they knew by Jewish law that it takes two independent testimonies to establish a fact. Isn't it fascinating that they don't debate that Jesus is the light of the world. They actually are trying to trap him on some kind of technicality. You you can't claim to be God, Jesus, without a second witness. As if that was the most outrageous thing that he had said today, that he only had one witness. It's almost like these guys are are drowning. Maybe they've been struggling in a lake and they're, they're barely keeping their heads above water. And any moment, they're gonna go beneath the surface forever. And Jesus comes rowing up in his little boat and he reaches out and he says, I'm here to save you guys. And they're like, well, hold on a minute. I'd like to see the registration of your boat to make sure that it's okay. Like, are you, are you actually a licensed captain? We wanna make sure that we've got all, of, all the details in line. And so this legalism stops them from seeing what is right in front of them. Jesus is offering them a way out of sin and darkness and into his eternal light. And yet these experts in the law paid no attention to either their own need or to the claims of Jesus. Instead, they were just grappling for an excuse to discredit him. I wonder, might some of you be doing the same thing? You don't actually wanna take at face value or to investigate and look at the claims of Christ, but we'll look for some other way out. Maybe it's as simple as just saying, I just don't believe it and moving on. Perhaps you think that all paths lead to God and so Jesus can't be the only way. Maybe you think actually Jesus is okay, seems like a good guy, but I don't think he's God. Maybe you think if there is eternal life, and God's grading on a curve, I've gotta be just over the top 50%, so I should be fine. I I wonder how many of us are also too quick to deny the claims of Christ before we've really investigated him. Jesus now turns his attention and he addresses this baseless claim and he affirms that he is indeed worthy of their trust. Jesus does this in three different ways, first of all, In verse 14, he says that his testimony is true. Verse 14, Jesus answered them, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and I know where I'm going, but you do not know where I came from or where I am going. All right, Pharisees, let's just say for a moment that you're right, that I don't have any other witnesses. Let's just say that that's true. My testimony is still true. 
Sure, we as humans, I, I certainly do this. I can tell a story in a way that makes me sound more heroic or, or maybe that will build sympathy for me. I can leave out details. I can add things to the story to make myself look better. But, but this is Jesus. Jesus, truly God, truly man. He is truth. Everything he speaks is truth. So he is no ordinary witness. And when Jesus says, I know where I came from and I know where I'm going, he's saying, look, I, I am from heaven. And when my work is done here, I am going back to the heavenly places. Seven different times in this chapter of John alone, Jesus says that he is from heaven. Jesus needs no corroborating witness. He came from heaven and he will return there. He is God. His word is enough. And you know, there's a great truth here that I don't want you to miss. When Jesus says, I know where I came from and I know where I'm going, this line tells us an awful lot about the character of the Lord that we serve. This is not some distant God who, who created the cosmos and then he goes back and sits back on his recliner and just lets it all play out. No, th this is a God who's intensely personal, who desires to have relationship with each and every one of us. Consider for a moment the fact that the sovereign God of the universe left heaven and came down to earth. Came to earth in the form of Jesus of Nazareth to live the perfect life that you and I could not. To pay the penalty for our sins and our rebellions that we cannot pay. He did all of that so that we could join him in heaven for all of eternity. All other religions and philosophies, they, they instruct people on all of the lists and things that you need to do to be able to hopefully earn God's favor at the end of your life. It's Christianity alone that has an entirely different formula. It's not about what you do, but what God has done. In fact, the Bible makes it clear that there's actually nothing that we can do to earn God's favor. The good news is, he offers it to us freely. The question is whether we will accept it or not. If we confess that Christ was crucified, died and was buried, that he rose from the grave, that he conquered sin and death, if we confess that, then we are the Lord's children and we can never be snatched away from his hands. In coming to earth, the sovereign God of the universe gave up heaven so that we could experience it. Jesus says, my testimony is true. And now he says, my judgment is sure. Verse 15, he says, you judge according to the flesh, speaking to the Pharisees. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and my Father who sent me. Here Jesus is dropping some truth on the Pharisees. Who are you to judge me? Is, is it all of your 20, 30, 40, 50 years of life experience that gives you so much wisdom that you can judge the God of the universe? You're, you're not able to judge. You're using the wrong criteria. You're coming at this from a human perspective. And Jesus says, I judge no one. And we do see elsewhere in scripture where Jesus does judge. And so what he's referring to here is I don't judge in the way that you do. You judge from a human perspective and I do not. Jesus making it clear that he's got an entirely different criteria for judging than did the Pharisees. We, we see the issues from a human perspective. And just consider our world today. Think of the things that we think are right or wrong or good or bad as a culture and as a society. And I, I, for right now, I'm not even telling you like what side of any topic to take. Just the fact that we are so divided on things will tell you humanity can't quite all get on the same page about what is true and right and how to judge. There's little agreement among us. And so we need somebody higher and higher authority than us to judge. And Jesus says, yet even if I do judge in verse 16, my judgments are true for it is not I alone who judge, but I and my father who sent me. So how does Jesus support his claim that he can witness and he can judge? He goes way above the authority of the Pharisees. He says, my judgment is in alignment with the sovereign God of the universe. There's no higher judge than him. So Jesus has shown that his testimony is true, his judgment is sure, and now he says that his testimony has been corroborated anyway. 
In verse 17, in your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself and the father who sent me bears witness about me. Kind of fascinating that Jesus says your law. He's talking about the Old Testament scriptures, but clearly saying you guys are looking at it in the wrong way. You have the wrong interpretation. So your law. And he goes back to this original objection that there was only one witness, so Jesus couldn't claim to be the light of the world. It's a principle that's found in the books of Deuteronomy and Numbers. Again, that a testimony to be true had to be validated by two different people. So Jesus says, actually, I do have a second witness. It's God the Father. God has borne public witness to Jesus through statements that he made, like in Matthew 3, where it says, and behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. God has witnessed to who Jesus is when Jesus fulfilled 300 prophecies that we find in the Old Testament scriptures, prophecies that were written hundreds and even thousands of years before Jesus walked on the planet, 300 verses about the Messiah, 300 prophecies, and Jesus fulfills all of them, fulfilled prophecy, witnesses, and testifies to Jesus. There are other personal testimonies like John the Baptist. There's the Holy Spirit. And Jesus could even call upon the miracles that he had done. Those also are testimony to who I am and why I have come. Jesus has made a case that his testimony should be trusted. You know, I was thinking about some of the things that we maybe trust in. And maybe because I have a doctor's appointment, I have a physical next week, I'm thinking about medical stuff. And, you know, I, I will go visit my PA and they'll do the lab work and test my blood and, and always kind of looking at, for me, it's kind of how my cholesterol is doing. And, and they've got me on this atorvastatin, which helps keep my cholesterol down. And they're recommending the milligrams. And so I'm actually trusting a lot of people in my health care. I'm trusting my PA to do the right thing and, and to correctly find out what's wrong with me. I'm trusting the pharmaceutical companies to actually make the drug in the right way. I'm trusting the pharmacist to fulfill it the right way. And maybe, maybe you're saying, you know, well, that's not a great analogy because I'm not sure I trust Western medicine. That's fine. I, I, no matter what it is, I think even the most ardent do-it-yourselfers among us would admit there are some things that they have to trust another expert for. Is that the folks that are working on your car and your brakes and your steering column? Is that the person who's rewiring the electricity in your house? We know that there are some people who have wisdom greater than ours, and so we look to them and we look for their advice to help us. So who do we look to? Who do we trust for spiritual advice? Ourselves? With our own limited experience? With hearts that, if we're honest, can be pretty dark sometimes? We have our own biases, our own desires that we want to be true. Maybe we look to other people that are just as lost and stumbling through the dark as we are, and we hope that they have answers on how to find the light. Shouldn't we look to the God of the universe, the one who created us, the one who built us? Isn't that who we should trust our spiritual health and well-being and our eternity to? Jesus is making his point to the Pharisees and he says, my testimony is true. It's true because Jesus is the author and definer of truth, not the shifting human or cultural standards. Jesus judges from a perfect and eternal perspective, not a flawed human perspective. And Jesus does indeed have other witnesses in corroboration, God the Father, and there is no higher authority. So I wonder... Who are you trusting for your spiritual well-being? Jesus' testimony is true, and so now we are left with this lingering question of how will we respond? Going back to verse 16 again, it says, Yet, even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. And they said to him, the Pharisees answered, Well, where is your Father? And Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because the hour 
His hour had not yet come. Verse 19, where is your father? Jesus has been talking about his father and now the Pharisees are asking, well, where is he? Where is your father? And if we fast forward a little bit to verse 27 of this chapter, we see that actually the Pharisees didn't even understand that Jesus was talking about God the Father. They can't even comprehend that this Jesus who's standing in front of them is talking about God, that he and the Father are one. Even though these Pharisees, these men were experts in the word of God, had studied it their entire life, arguably knew it better than anyone, they didn't recognize the son of God when he was standing right in front of them. You know, I think it's shocking that those who claim to follow God absolutely missed him. And I think that should serve as a sober reminder to those of us who come to church and fill in the blanks or check the boxes, just kind of going through the motions. It's not religious activity that's gonna save us. It's only grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus goes on, he says, if you knew me, you would know my father also. Jesus and the father are one. Rejecting Jesus was to reject God and rejecting God was to reject Jesus. Several times in John's account of the life of Jesus, he makes this same statement that if you would know me, you knew God. And if you knew God, then you would know me. You cannot know one without the other. Theologian R.C. Sproul put it this way. He said, there are millions, if not billions of people in this world who claim to know God as their father and yet reject Jesus, the son. You cannot know God the father and reject the son and you cannot know the son and reject the father because their testimony is one. And here John calls out again that Jesus was teaching in the temple not only did they have the light of the world, the son of God standing right before them, they were in the temple. Irony on top of irony, this place where they would go to worship God and long for him to come back and hope that he would lead them out of their present darkness and into a great light. There he was right in front of them. And they missed him. For the Pharisees holding on to the legalism of the law, they missed the God that their law was pointing to. It's almost as if they had become so familiar with stumbling around in the dark that they didn't recognize the light when it was right there. You know, a dear friend of mine um, that I've known for just a couple of years, and I was talking with him this last week, and, and he was a guy who had spent a little time in prison, and so I just wanted to know a little bit more about his story. And so I, I was asking him if he would share a little bit about his story, and, and he told me that he was really good at making money. He would make money and make money, and that would build his ego up, and as his ego was built up, he would try to make more and more money, and his ego would grow, and the more his ego would grow, the more chances and risks he took to the point where he eventually was breaking the law to make money. And then he got caught, and everything fell apart he started to see the damage that his life of walking in the darkness had done. Certainly he lost his job, he lost his wealth, even started to lose relationships and family members. And eventually, as I said, he lost his freedom and he spent some time in prison. He described to me the, the very deep, dark moments that he had in prison described how he would see so many around him that were just trapped in this endless cycle of destruction, depression, and despair, and it was just looping over and over and over. He was in this deep, dark place. And yet, I didn't know him then, and I know him now, and I, I was like, you are a totally different man. What, what happened? And he said it was in the midst of those dark moments. He said, I, I surrendered myself to Jesus. And on the surface, it felt very ugly, but inside, I knew God was working on me. If I wouldn't have completely surrendered, I don't know what the outcome would have been. I experienced redemption and restoration as he built and strengthened me. He gave me courage to face the darkness, knowing that he is the light. He removed all my fear, and I was able to see how damaging the darkness was in my own life. 
his renewed life has indeed brought life and changed things for him. He's working hard to restore the broken relationships. After his release from prison, he said, gone is this unhealthy desire for money. He's like, it's just not even there anymore. And in fact, he's actually paid back his full restitution that was owed. And one of the things that I love about him is that he's not content to simply bask in the light and in this new life. But he described to me his passion and his heart to go back in, not just for the men in prison, but anybody who is trapped in darkness. He wants them to see the light that he experienced. You know, I think my friend's story maybe has a little something for all of us. There's a warning there for those that are walking in darkness, maybe getting comfortable. Life's pretty good. By earthly standards, you're having some success. But I can tell you, either in this life or in eternity, staying in the darkness does not end well. Doesn't end well for anyone. And for those like my friend that desperately want to get out of the darkness, might it be as simple as just fully surrendering to Jesus Christ, claiming him as Lord, following him, recognizing that he is the light of the world. For those of us who maybe have been followers of Jesus for a long time, you you know, we actually are not the light. Jesus is the light. We're more like the moon and we reflect his light. And so let's be reflectors of his light pointing back to Jesus. Let's bring the hope and the help of the gospel into this dark and hurting world. This passage started with a bold claim by Jesus that was full of Old Testament imagery and it was full of the eternal promises of God to his people. But the Pharisees missed it. They missed this beautiful offer to walk in the light. What about you? Jesus is calling you. Are you ready to follow him into the light? Let me pray. Father God, as we look at the the pages of scripture, the words of Jesus and this debate that he had with the Pharisees, Father God, I just pray that we would be reminded that you are the light of the world, Father, that it is by you and through you that we see and experience everything. So Father, I do pray for those that have not yet experienced that. Father God, might today be the day where they say, yes, I want to follow Jesus. I want to experience that light. I want to be with the sovereign God of the universe for all of eternity. Father, for those of us that are here that have been following you for some while, maybe our light is getting dim and we're not shining into the dark places as much as we used to. Father, would you give us courage and opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ with this hurting world? I pray, Father, even this week that friends and relatives and coworkers, people that maybe have been on our hearts and minds, Father God, would you give us doorways into conversations? Would you help us to broach that topic, to go back into the darkness and pull people out and towards your glorious light? Father, we can do these things only by the matchless name of your son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name that we pray, amen. Amen, let's stand together and worship.
this message going to step into the light you know we're here to help we're here to assist but his light is there for you to step into and maybe maybe you need to step with him in that light and you're kind of struggling in that area as well I just encourage you take the truth that Kurt has just preached to us all do something with it. Take that step, whatever it is that he's asking you to do. We'll be down here in front. We're here to pray with you. We're here to encourage you, pray and help you with that next step, wherever it may be. But I want to leave with you this wonderful blessing as I pray this over you all. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.